the singularity is bullshit. Why is that? There is this uh, narrative out there, and it's a very popular narrative, and it's very compelling, which is that at some point, machines are going to become as intelligent as human beings, and then they can apply their intelligence to making themselves even smarter. The story is that it all spirals out of our control. And of course, this is the plot of quite a lot of science fiction movies, notably Terminator. I love those movies just as much as anybody does. Um, but it, it's, it's deeply implausible. And I became frustrated with that narrative for all sorts of reasons. One of which is that that narrative, whenever it comes up in sort of serious debate about where AI is going and what the risks are, you know, there are real risks associated with AI, it tends to suck all the oxygen out of the room in the, in the, in the, in the phrase that my colleague used. And it tends to dominate the conversation and distract us from things that we should really be talking about. Right. In fact, there is a discipline that's come out of this called existential risk. Right? right. It's kind of the worrying about the Terminator situation and figuring out how can we perhaps better align these super intelligent agents to, to human interests. Um, and if you look at not just the narrative, but actually the funding <laughs> and what the smartest people are devoting their time into thinking in, in not only companies, but policy groups, X risk, existential risk is, is the dominant share of the entire market, so to speak. Why do you think this narrative has, has gained such a, such a big, uh, big following? I think it's the low probability, but very, very high risk argument uh, that, I mean, I think most people accept that this is not tremendously plausible, but if it did happen, it would be the worst thing ever. And so very, very, very high risk. And when you multiply that probability by the risk, then it's the argument is that it's something that you should that you should start to think about. But um, you know, this when the success of large language models became apparent and chat GPT was released and everybody got very excited about this last year, the kind of debate around this sort of reached sort of slightly hysterical levels. Um, and it became slightly unhinged at some point. My sense is the debate has calmed down a little bit and is being more focused on, on the actualities of where we are and what the risks are. Right. I think that's quite a charitable reading, I think, <laughs> of, of the psychology, right? It's a rational calculus. And there's a small probability, but there's a large sort of cost. I study religious history. And when I talk to people in the X-risk world, the psychology kind of reminds me of uh, the, the, the Christian apocalyptics. That there's these people throughout Christian history that are like, now's the time. You know, this happened most recently, probably when we were uh, going through the millennium, right? 1999. Yeah. And it's this psychological drive that wants to grab at something total and eschatological in a way to orient the entire world. Yeah. And so, so people, I guess what I'm trying to highlight is I mean, maybe you can see some of the psychology and climate risk as well. It's not to say that these things are true, right? It's not to say that the world isn't ending in Christianity, that the climate isn't changing, or there is no X risk. It's that the reason that people seem attracted to this narrative is almost a relig religious phenomenon. I think that's right. And I think it appeals to something almost primal and kind of human nature. I mean, it's most fundamental level. It's the idea that you create something, you have a child and they turn on you. You know, that kind of the ultimate nightmare for parents. You know, you give right. birth, you nurture something, you, you create something. Zeus and, and Kronos, right? It's exactly so. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, and this, that narrative, that story is very, very resonant. And for example, you go back to the, the original science fiction text, Frankenstein, mm -hmm. that literally is the plot of Frankenstein. You use science to create life, to, to give life to something, to create something, and then it turns on you and you've lost control of that thing. So it's a very, very resonant idea, I think. It's so very easy for people to latch on to. Right. You know, it's easy for us to critique the psychology here, but, but what, it's, what, it, what do you think is wrong or what do you think people miss about the argument itself? that once we have super intelligent or, or at least uh, on par with human level uh, machine intelligence, that they can recursively improve upon themselves. What, what do you think people are missing when they give too much weight to that, that argument? The frustrating part is the Skynet part of the argument, you know, the kind of the Terminator thing that suddenly this will spiral out of control in ways that we just can't control in an incredibly short, um, an incredibly short period of time. If you look under the hood of how these things work and how many patches are required to hold AI together, um, it just it just doesn't seem terribly plausible. More concretely, there are basically two arguments for how existential risk might come around. 
And the first is the famous paperclip argument, which I'm sure you're familiar with. You know, so you build a highly intelligent machine and you ask it to build as many paperclips as possible, and it follows your instructions in ways that you didn't anticipate. Right. For example, enslaving all of humanity. Enslaving to build more all of humanity right. and turning them to the production of paperclips. Uh, you know, until it turns everything into paperclips. That's the uh, that's the paperclip argument. And there is some strength to that argument in the sense that AI can go wrong in those ways. But for it to uh, to, to hurt us, it has to be empowered to hurt us. Right. You know, we have to give it the keys. We right, have to right, give it right. control. Assuming there's no uh, guardrails. And there's right. no guardrails. And again, that just doesn't seem terribly plausible that, that we would do that. I mean, it would be a dumb thing for us to do to hand over the nukes to an AI. So that's the first argument about how AI might become an existential threat. The second argument is just that we build very, very intelligent machines which develop their own goals which aren't aligned right. with ours. Now, this is much more nebulous. We don't know how that might happen. Um, uh, it's, and, and so it's slightly harder to address. But we really aren't at the moment anywhere near that. And I don't see, right. even with very, very powerful AI that we have now, the roadmap from where we go to that. Right. So to, to summarize your understanding, uh, the first case is when the AI is executing our goals, but not ingesting the kind of uh, assumptions and implicit values exactly that, so. that the humans are imputing. Whereas the second one is the AI have developed their own goals. Um, and there, it seems even more far-fetched because LLMs, as, as powerful as they are, they don't seem to be have any semblance of agency, right? Yeah. And that's fundamentally what it would require. Yeah. So me and my friends have actually come up with this <laughs> half-joking term called existential risk-risk which is the risk upon a society that focuses too much on existential risk and away from other, other risks that we could actually be facing due to AI today. If you can wave a magical wand and, and swing the narrative of AI away from X risk, what are the actual problems uh, and, and conversations that we should be having right now? 